Hello, and welcome to the program. My name is Sam Ankerson. I'm the executive director of the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum here in Sanibel, and want to thank you for joining this program, and especially want to thank our speaker, uh, Tina Petway, uh, for putting together a wonderful presentation that you'll enjoy very much, and I uh, look forward to introducing her in a few moments. Uh, this talk that, uh, that Tina is going to give is about a project that, that I and, and the museum find to be very, very meaningful, which is the, the redesign and, and reinstallation of the George Strake Hall of Malacology at the Houston Museum of Natural Science. This was a, um, a, a permanent, this is a permanent exhibition of, of mollusks of shells that uh, opened in, or the, the redesigned version opened in 2019. And it's, it's a, frankly, just a stunning display. I had the chance to visit last spring and visit with Tina and her colleagues. And it's, um, uh, can't, can't recommend highly enough that if you haven't had the chance to visit that, that you do. And we feel a certain kinship with, with Tina and, and the Houston Museum of Natural Sciences as um, maybe the only two museums in the country with substantial exhibitions of permanent exhibitions of, of shells and, and mollusks. Uh, of course, many museums have great collections, inc including many great natural history museums. But the trend in recent decades uh, has been uh, towards less public exhibition of these collections. They, they still function very well as research collections. But Houston, uh, especially as, as a major natural history museum, which Houston is, has, has really been a leader in maintaining prominence um, in this area and in investing in such a beautiful and, and substantive redesign of its exhibition. And we're, we're as the Billy Matthews, we're, we're honored to be uh, also um, also a museum that um, uh, that maintains a, a substantial permanent exhibit of, of shells and mollusks. And so I like the fact that we're sort of on either side of the Gulf of Mexico and, um, and we have this in common. So um, uh, Tina will, of course, take you through um, um, all the all the great stuff um, that led to the reopening. Uh, before um, we get to that and introduce Tina, I just wanted to briefly uh, give an update on the, the status of the Shell Museum. This is uh, since Hurricane Ian uh, struck on, um, on September 28th. Um, we, we had, of course, been in a, a period of, of reacting and, and, uh, and rebuilding. Um, and, and when we've had these programs, our, our, online, our monthly online lecture series, we've taken the opportunity just to provide a uh, a brief update on what's going on. So I, I, I know a number of people who attend these lectures also are, are familiar with what's going on at the museum and, and, and have, have heard these updates before. So I won't, I won't go into, um, hopefully I won't be uh, repeating a, a whole lot of what's been said before, but, um, but for the benefit of those, you know, who this may be the first um, sort of hearing about this, um, the, the, the museum is a is a three story structure with aquariums on its ground level, um, the shell exhibits on the second level, and on the top level are offices and where we store our research collection of shells. And we and the hurricane um, dealt a you know, major impact from a from a water point of view and from a structural damage point of view to all three levels in in different ways. The the most significant events were about five and a half feet of flooding on the on the ground level and a and a, a big hole that was torn in a in was basically a brand new roof um, that meant uh, a lot of a lot of water damage and and risk happening up on the uh, up on the third floor where the where the research collection is stored uh, after uh, several months the uh, what you're seeing now is a pretty Pretty, pretty close representation of, um, of where the museum is today, which is to say that it's, it's cleaned out, it's, it's dried out. Uh, about 40% of the, 
of the ceilings and walls um, of, the, of the building have been gutted. The uh, reason for that being is uh, they get wet, they get moldy, don't want the mold to spread. And um, so everything needs to be, needs to be taken out. Um, thankfully, the research collection of, of, of specimens is, uh, although exposed to the elements, is, is fine. We, we did temporarily relocate about 40% of it to, uh, to another part of the museum for, for safekeeping. But, um, uh, but fortunately, um, we we're able to, um, fortunately, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, it wasn't damaged. Um, so now we've, you know, after, after several months of this, you know, as they call it, remediation work, we are turning the corner and heading into uh, reconstruction and repairs. We have just uh, completed um, a confirmation of a, of a general contractor selection, which, um, which was a process that took some time. And uh, they may begin work as soon as April 1st um, or, or thereabouts. We, we hope that's, um, we of course hope that's a, you know, it's a timeline that can be adhered to. And uh, as far as how long this may take, it, um, it's, uh, that's a little bit of an unknown. There is, there is the basic repair work that needs to happen to the museum, which is, which is quite substantial. Uh, there are also some um, updates and improvements and, and changes that we're looking to, uh, to take this time to implement, things we had been thinking about. Um, things, you know, ways we, we exhibit um, some of the shells, um, some of the ways in which we're um, interpreting some of the content in the, in the aquariums. So our, our, while we don't have a firm timeline, our, our sense is that uh, within a couple of months, we'll be, you know, we'll be under, you know, active construction and that uh, all in all, this may be something like the better part of a year process with the strong possibility that we have a kind of a phased reopening. For example, it, it looks like it's um, uh, perhaps more straightforward and quicker to for the aquarium level to be fully restored first. That would open to the public and then we'd move up to the second and third floor um, from there. So that's that's kind of how it's how it's looking right now. And uh, we're glad to be we're glad to be close to entering uh, the point of reconstruction. And that's kind of how it is on Sanibel in general. Um, that's, uh, you know, basically sort of homes and businesses are sort of in between the, the, the emergency response and, and mitigation part of things and heading into um, the plans and, and actions for, for rebuilding. Uh, we don't expect any any um, major changes to the marine life that's exhibited on the aquarium level for, for people who are familiar with that. We'll, we um, have a, a couple of, of ideas of adjustments to make here and there, but we'll still be uh, exhibiting octopuses and, um, and cuttlefish and local mollusks and mollusks from the Pacific Northwest and uh, Pacific uh, coral ecosystems and, and, red, and red mangrove systems and, and all that. and um, um, so that's um, the aquariums, which are just about two years old anyway, um, were very, very successful. And so we're, we're looking forward to bringing those back close to, um, to, to how they were when, when the storm struck. Uh, it, you know, cost wise, um, it's, you know, it's hard to put exact numbers on it right now. It's certainly all, you know, heading into the, into the several millions. And um, we're very grateful for, the support in many forms, which has um, which has come to the museum since the storm, um, including philanthropy, and and we thank everyone who has been part of that. We thank everyone who has sent well wishes. We thank everyone who has uh, offered to volunteer. We've we've just begun to have opportunities for volunteers to be back in the building, and um, and so we're we're grateful for all that. This, this moving forward, this uh, addressing all of this is going to be a combination of, of insurance payments, um, some of which have started to come in. We're working with FEMA, as, um, as so many are, and, um, and then philanthropy is going to continue to be a very important part of this because in, a, 
um, in addition to the problem of, of preparing the facility, um, this is a community that relies heavily on the tourism tourism economy, and um, we're looking at probably something, you know, certainly one, two years um, before that is really back to normal. So um, that's, uh, that's another consideration as well. But in addition to all this, what else are we doing? Um, just quickly, um, for one thing, we're, we're open. <laughs> So uh, on Feb, this is a this is a, a picture of a ribbon cutting recently, and and on February first, we uh, we reopened in a in a temporary way, in a limited hours way, in a limited exhibits kind of way, but um, uh, but for the time being, we're open now Tuesday through Friday, eleven a.m. to three p.m. with a free admission. And what will visitors get to see if they visit? Uh, the Great Hall of Shells, although, um, which is our permanent exhibit hall, although um, battered in terms of its ceilings and walls, the, the exhibits in there are okay. That is open. We also have put together a, a new exhibit, which is on the walls now. And it's something that's getting added to all the time. This is uh, uh, an exhibit of photographs of the storm and its aftermath. And uh, we invite submissions, we invited submissions and continue to invite submissions from anyone impacted by this storm. And the, and the photos can be of anything. They can be of damage, they can be of hope, they can be of uh, new friends they made, they can be of you know, people who helped them. And um, we, have, um, we have hundreds of photos up now in this exhibit. And we, we, we accept all, we don't, we don't, we don't, uh, um, we don't curate for for uh, photographic expertise or anything like that. So this is something that's meant to be participatory and and evolving as people contribute to it. So if you're if you're watching, if you're listening, and would be interested in submitting um, photographs to be included in this, please visit our website under special exhibitions. And there's a it's a very straightforward process to do so. We'd love to um, we'd lo love to have your your photographs included. Of course, we're we're our online lecture series, which we're all we're all here for tonight. Uh, these three talks are the next ones coming up uh, in the series. Alexa Elliott, a a PBS uh, uh, producer, will do. Um, she's on March twenty third. Uh, Pete Malinowski, who is the director of the Billion Oyster Project, this is a, a really really interesting urban conservation. Um, initiative uh, to restore oysters to uh, New York City Harbor and, um, and up the Hudson River, and he's been leading that. And then our own uh, Dr. Jose Leal on, on May 17th will, will give a talk on, on micromollusks. Uh, these are all free. You can, you can, they're all by Zoom, uh, just like this. So um, you, all, you all did register this way, but um, the, the way to do it is to register um, on our website um, through education um, lectures. And um, I would mention too that all the online lectures that we've that we've ever done have been recorded and are available on that same web page for viewing. They're just they're archived there. So there are um, about twenty there now. I'm reaching back a couple of years, and, and Tina's talk will be um, will be is being recorded as well, and will be up there um, within the week. Another program we're doing this spring is is a new. Um, a new initiative, it's, it's out in the field, I guess it's called Field Education, um, called Snail Search of Lee County. So what this is, um, is uh, through guided biodiversity walks and the dates and, and locations are, are listed there. And, um, and other means, we, it's a community science project basically where we, where we train uh, people to use the, uh, uh, the app iNaturalist to record wildlife observations throughout Lee County, which is our, our county here in Southwest Florida, with a particular focus on land snails for which there's a, uh, a very limited set of data on land snail species represented in this part of Florida. So we're working to engage the community to help, um, to help record those observations and try to, try to get a better sense of it. Um, if you'd like to join one of these, one of these walks where you um, go with one of our educators and learn how to use iNaturalist and make these observations. These are the dates and times coming up this spring, and the website there um, is, is how to participate in that. And then lastly, uh, towards the end of spring, 
We are excited about a, a fundraising benefit that we have planned uh, April 24th. This will be in Fort Myers, and it's, um, it's going to feature a performance by the stand-up comedian and former Saturday Night Live cast member Kevin Nealon. Um, so uh, if anybody is interested in joining us for that, it should be a very, a very fun uh, evening. So um, with that, um, I will, um, before introducing Tina, we'll just say, you know, for if you have questions um, for the, um, for tonight's program, please use the chat function, which is, uh, um, and just type in your questions and we'll monitor those. And, um, and after Tina's talk, um, we'll, we'll do Q and A. And, uh, and now it's my, my pleasure to, to introduce Tina Petway, who has been collecting and studying mollusks for uh, over 60 years and doing research and collecting throughout Texas and also many of the South Pacific island nations, including the Solomon Islands, uh, Fiji, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, Singapore. Um, she began volunteering at the Houston Museum of Natural Science in 1999 and became the associate curator of malacology there in 2005. And it's my pleasure to welcome our, our colleague and our friend, um, Tina Petway. Thank you very much. Hey, Sam, how things there in Florida? They're good. Thank you, Tina. <laughs> Thank you. We're expecting a little rain, so it's not too bad so far. We'll, we'll All right. Soon. Good. Um, if uh, if you'll bear with us just a second, I will start this program. Um, we were given the opportunity to revamp the entire George W. Strait Hall of Malacology uh, beginning in 2018. And um, through the work of our exhibits department, which I cannot give enough credit to, uh, they're incredibly wonderful in ways that I ask for things to be exhibited, um, specifically things that would not damage shells, such as lighting. Um, if you'll notice throughout as we go through this, the lighting is bright, but it's not a hot light. It is not the type of light that will damage our specimens over any length of time. So, um, we hope you enjoy this. And anytime you're in Houston, let us know. We'd love to give you a personal tour. Hey, Tina, this is yeah. Sam. I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay. If um, there's been a few requests on chat, if you're able to maybe speak up a little bit, um, that I would be great. definitely talk louder. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. How's that? It sounds better to me. Thank you. Okay. If I get too soft, holler. Okay. This is the uh, first scene you come to as you come up the stairs at the museum, um, the George W. Strake Hall of Malacology. We begin by talking about the oceans and they're important to the world and to especially to uh, ocean oceanic malacology, which is seashells rather than land snails or fresh water. So, we talk about black corals, and here you see two exhibited. The smaller one is an example from the Philippines. The larger one was part of a confiscation by a customs department here in Houston that involved six specimens of black coral that had been chopped out of their environment off of Peru and were intended to come here to Houston to some jewelers where they were going to make jewelry out of the black coral. As you know, black corals have been uh, endangered and are on the CITES list of endangered species. So uh, kindly, the customs department called us and asked if we were interested in having these, and I said, absolutely. So here you see the largest example, although it looks a little denuded there in the center, it was cleaned by the collectors, I assume, and had some of the, the black coral itself polished so that the purchaser could see what they were actually getting. Um, although it does kind of look like a feathery bush, this is a living group of organisms. Um, this larger one we estimate is about 3,000 years old. So you understand how long it takes to grow these and their importance. 
Hey, hey, Tina, Sam again. Sorry, this will be the last time. Um, just, you know, a little, little more volume if you can. Um, okay. That'd be great. Thanks. All right. Okay. Um, of course, I was uh, did a dance here in um, the office when I was told that we were going to redo the old hall. Uh, and I asked for a large sledgehammer to start tearing things apart. But they wouldn't give me a big one. This is the worst they would let me get to uh, doing any damage myself. I don't know. They thought maybe I was going to break something. That <laughs> was my intent. Um, this is kind of an, an idea of what one of the workbenches of our models uh, for the, the mounts that actually hold the shells. Um, these gentlemen worked for days, weeks, and months building specific mounts, which you will see as we get into the exhibits themselves. But each one is fitted exactly to each shell. And this is our major mount maker who incidentally is a jeweler. So these things are absolutely exquisite on their own. This is part of the mounts that were made. And you notice each little mount has its tag. It has a colored tag, which tells you where it, what exhibit it goes in. It has a picture of the shell and it also has the number uh, for the catalog that we, nothing got made that didn't have an attached label. So everything went exactly where it was supposed to go, we thought. <laughs> the best laid plans, right? Um, this is one of the major shells that you'll see toward the end of the program. This is the world record Cyrinx um, from Australia, Cyrinx Aranus or Australian Trumpet. And this is the mount on the left that was made specifically for it. Um, we took a long time because this is a heavy shell. This is the same shell on the left before cleaning. The shell on the right is the world record albino of the same species, the Australian trumpet. Just so that everybody would see that these were not radiated. <laughs> which unfortunately is happening more and more in order to sell shells. Um, this was a naturally occurring albino. And there's <laughs> the two shells once they were cleaned and you see the tubs in which I took them a while for me to pick them clean as they appear now. But um, the guys who made the mounts and who actually put them onto the mounts were rather proud of themselves at that point. This is another one of the problems we came across. This is a set of matching natural pearls that were gifted to the museum. And the problem is they are not drilled, so they could not be strung. We did not want to drill them just for this. We wanted them as natural as possible. So how do you display those without damaging the shells? Well, it took a while to come up with a design as well as the implements to do it with. And um, I think we succeeded pretty well, as you will see further on. This is the exhibit where they actually appear. Um, this is uh, a group of mollusks that all have naturally occurring pearls. Um, almost any mollusk is capable of making a pearl. And we kind of tell that story uh, with this little exhibit right here. And as you can see on the far left in the middle is the Florida horse conch and it's a uh, pearl that came with it. And we're gonna kind of watch that same shell or same species appear in several different exhibits throughout the hall. This is that gorgeous shell with its uh, natural pearl. One of the other exhibits talks about uh, egg cases. Most people do not realize that uh, a great deal of mollusks are breeders that are not spawn breeders. They actually have uh, form eggs. And as you see here, there are egg clusters. And as in the example on the bottom left, you will see some shells that have gotten trapped in there. Those are females that got trapped when a group of females all realized it was occurring, spawning was occurring, 
and they group spawn. And these shells unfortunately got trapped underneath other eggs being laid. And so that was their fate. This clump actually washed up on a Florida beach and was donated to us. We would never have taken that out of the wild, just so you know. Um, the same thing with the other uh, large clump on the right. Um, as you can see, this is set on a piece of paper. This we knew there were two sizes of exhibits that would be working in the hall. And we needed to know how things would look in those and where they would be placed before we actually got to that. So this was our method of using graph, paper, and um, taping off. You can see shells that have been X'd out. There simply was not room or they were deemed less than necessary. You will see that further on as well. Um, this is another method we have of putting things together before we actually put them into an exhibit to decide what to put and how to put it. And I can't stand seeing things placed blink, blink, blink all the way across, as you'll see later on. I really enjoy a visual uh, scene that draws your attention to what's going on and is not so boring. This is what that same exhibit looks like now in the hall. I will stress one thing again, please notice the beautiful lighting and there are no shadows. Each shell appears to hang in midair, and that is because of our fantastic mounts. And I'm going to again applaud our mount makers. This is another case. This was the case on how we set up with the pearls exhibit. And you've already seen that case. Again, with a family, we started out with about twice as many in this one case. We simply ran out of time to make enough mounts. So that's what this looks like with all the things in it. You see it's a little undercrowded, but that means you get to see everything a little better. Here again, we laid things out. It was too much, too big, so some things had to go. This is one of the exhibits that actually talks about things that are edible to man and frequently you will find them on restaurant menus as well as your own table. Oysters, scallops, clams, mussels, um, occasionally, <clears throat> excuse me, occasionally abalone, which in a few places around the world is now being farm raised. Thank you for all those places doing that farm raising to protect wild uh, habitats and the wild um, species. This is another setup. Two separate species of mollusks are shown here. One is the uh, endemic uh, species from Hawaii on the left, from a tiny juvenile up to fully adult. Um, the same thing on the right is another Philippine species, the largest of that particular, particular family of murex. And this is a color and size growth of this murex. Same thing for a couple of volutes. On the left is uh, Voluta musica in some of its different forms and colors and a growth series of those. And then on the right, all the same species of amphora, which is a volute also. These are also edible and are frequently obtained because they've been collected for food. This is one of the exhibit cases that had fresh water. Um, these are all freshwater shells. I'm not sure that that came out. This was some of our guys that put together the exhibits that we actually made. As you can see, we made uh, attempts to try different things to see what would work in the work best. As you can see on the one on the right, we tried many different kinds of backgrounds to see which black looked best. We tried fabric, we tried uh, formica, we tried paint, uh, and we finally ended up with fabric, if you can believe that. Here we are trying to put together the case that has the corals in it because it cannot be laid out like we did the shells. These are more three-dimensional. 
but instead of having a deep case to put them in, we were limited into 14 inches. So it means they had to go up rather than back. This is the gentleman who is the head of our exhibits department, Rodney Gentry. He oversaw along with uh, the uh, head of the exhibit gentlemen themselves. Um, we like uh, <clears throat> all kinds of things, as you can tell by the Star Wars. <laughs> This is our photographer. Um, Mike is absolutely incredible. Here he is photographing some of the tiny shells, which you will see later on. Um, we put into an interactive exhibit because most people never get to see tiny shells and what they really look like up close. You, you do not appreciate the beauty and the detail. And this is again, on the left is a tray with shells that have been matched up with their mounts finally. And here is one of our gentlemen putting the numbers on each shell after what's been installed. That was the easiest for us at this point. Here we are installing those two large um, black corals. Uh, this took a day to transport and mount them. You're again working through the hall, cleaning up constantly uh, as dust forms. This is a museum. We're very careful about what gets into the air. Here we're working, the guy on the right is working on lighting. And <laughs> we're checking to see if the lights are all working. This is two days before the actual opening. And there I am picking tiny strands of cotton out of some of the uh, corals that were put in. Last minute cleaning is never done. Sorry about the reflection, but because of the glass, uh, we do get quite a bit of reflection when we try to photograph. This is uh, an exhibit of rare specimens, rare shells and uh, we don't generally think this is all that important, except that people always want to see what is a rare shell. So this tells the story of what that actually involved. And this is the finished product of that coral uh, exhibit that you saw being put together. This particular exhibit not only has different kinds of coral, it has models of living mollusks, which are impossible to preserve because their soft parts cannot be um, saved in any way. So in order to see what a model looked like, you have to have the clay model. Also in here to add interest for people coming through, there are five different crabs or crustaceans in this exhibit. And people are frequently asked, can you find all five? Well, I'm sure you can see at least two from where you are in this at this point. This is beautiful spondylus. I'm sorry, I'm partial to prickly, spiny, frilly, ruffly pretties. But you have to understand most of these are edible and frequently are collected as food. This is looking down part of one of the hallways. Uh, you can see it's dark which helps to highlight all these gorgeous shells. This is another angle, <clears throat> and you can see some of the final exhibits. The cases in the front are exhibiting uh, land snails. On the back side of those two are um, freshwater uh, snails from both hemispheres. Again, uses by man, which uh, is useful for kids coming through. Teachers are frequently um, instructed on how to teach kids about where buttons used to come from. And so we have uh, the bottom left specimen is an abalone, which has had the buttons punched out by machine, whereas used to, they had to cut them by hand. Um, then you have other uses as money, uh, as decoration, uh, as wedding gifts. Um, in the upper right corner, you see is a, uh, a hook for catching uh, squids and oysters, which is carved out of shell. 
is another look at parts of the, the museum itself with some of the exhibits, which we do not have time to show you every one of. Would love to, but don't want you to fall asleep. Again, this is looking down one of the other corridors. It's a closer up look of those two exhibits that uh, have the growth series. And the stairwell, which also talks about some of the underwater fish, which are exhibited in the center of this particular floor. Just another view. This is an exhibit of albinos and their natural forms. Um, it did take quite a while to find all of these uh, albinos and then to find a natural specimen that was close to its same size. In the very center at the bottom is the Florida horse conch again with an albino. So uh, we do especially try to highlight local shells as much as possible. This is one of the shells in the exhibit uh, that has regained uh, some interest. It was carved in 1895 in Galveston, Texas. It shows a beautifully uh, recently completed uh, uh, Victorian building at that time in Galveston. Uh, the name of the building was Harmony Hall. It was carved by H.P. Nettleton. If you'll notice that even in the bottom right hand, you'll see a cart with a horse pulling it. Um, notice the shading on the windows. And this is a small tiger cowrie in Galveston, Texas. What the heck was it doing there? It didn't come there on its own. They don't come from there. And who was this H.P. Nettleton? So this started a search which we are still working on and have located a few other shells, which I will show you another time. Some of the close-ups of some of the really beautiful specimens that I thought you would enjoy seeing close-ups. The spondylus. This is one of my favorites. It's an oyster. Land snails. Another spondylus. I hope you're enjoying these colors. <laughs> They're just beautiful. Lovely specimens. Really delicate, beautiful. This happened to be our president's favorite shell. He didn't realize it was a teeny tiny. This ends our tour, basically, of the hall. Um, so we're going to do give you a walkthrough with a video. And this is the final exit from the hall. Uh, you'll notice again that large world record um, Australian trumpet and the world record albino. Lots of people like big shells. So we're ready to move on to our video. We're getting there. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I will try to talk loud enough through this because to talk through the hall as we were doing it became impossible. There were a lot of visitors that early in the morning already. Again, you're seeing close ups of those black corals that I told you about. And this is where you begin your tour. What are mollusks? And if you'll notice at the bottom of this, it has looked for ways each of us can help to save them throughout this exhibit by finding the pearls of wisdom symbol. That's one way we put of giving little hints to people so that they could do things to help the environment at home. Simple things. This is our list of donors and our gratitude to them for all their donations for the hall. Here's that first case with all of the corals. And now that we're looking at it, I'll let you see a couple of the crabs that you may not have seen sooner. There's one there. See the cute little guy? Isn't he cute? Sorry, I can't help it. I love the little stinkers. And then we have another one up in the far right corner. Then we have the hardest, oh, here I'm talking about the models. And um, 
These were donated by uh, Don Kaiser in California. Um, he donated quite a few of these uh, models that went with their shells. And here is the hardest one of the crabs to find in that tiny little opening is the tiniest cute little crab, isn't he cute? Then there's one more that was a little more difficult to find right here at the bottom of this red coral. So we've given a challenge to people coming in. Can you find all five of the crabs? And it gives them something to search and look for. It helps them notice everything because most people, unlike you all, are not particularly interested in shells. So how do we get them interested to understand how important mollusks are to the environment and to life as we know it? This is that case with all of the um, egg cases and the shells that laid them. Here I'm showing you the actual shell in the egg case. It's really sad. But they don't have a voice to say, wait, don't do that. Don't cover me up. That's a shame. Spawning events uh, are generally, for many species, um, large congregations of females will do this egg laying for protection out of all of those, a few may live to uh, adulthood. So the more that's in, this, in the group, the safer they are. This is uh, camouflage, talking about how shells disguise themselves or can be disguised. So everybody knows about Xenothra or the carrier shells. There's a couple of great examples right there in the center. And then sponges and other species grow on them and algae and worm tubes. So you always see those beautiful shells as they appear. This group is uh, a group of shells that are grazers. These guys are kind of like, we call them cows of the sea. They love to eat that algae and it's a good thing they do. Somebody has to eat that stuff to keep it from growing over. We talk about all kinds of ways that we can use these shells and more than one species can illustrate more than one fact. Here is uh, three families in one case, just to give you a little example of some of the pretties and some of the species, rare color forms, um, hybrids, again, Another family, this is the cone family. Uh, this is easy to talk about. Most people like hearing about poisonous things. So many of the cone shells are contain extremely poisonous and dangerous to man. So they love hearing that. This is one of our pet projects. This is a sensory project, especially for people who are uh, challenged in some way but anybody loves touching shells that have never even had a chance to. You'd be surprised how many people have never even been to a beach. So having these available with no sharp edges, nothing that's gonna hurt anybody, but they can actually feel. They're clean several times a day, just for your information. Color and where does it come from in mollusks? We don't paint any of them as I'm sure you know, but our visitors do not. And so the one frequently asked question is, where do they get the color? That is generally uh, dictated by uh, the species in particular. Adults and juveniles, this is something you very seldom see, juveniles of certain species along with their adults. This is one of my favorite, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> You get to see my favorites too. We have a couple of really beautiful videos in the exhibit. We do not have any live aquaria. This exhibit is on the second floor and when the museum was built, it was not built with aquaria in mind. So we've tried it, it just was not very successful. So instead of having aquaria, we try to show what 
uh, mollusks are frequently seen in uh, our own waters as well as the tropical waters where they're really beautiful. So we're talking about predators and predators can be all kinds of shells. Uh, here we have some you will be familiar with and some you may not have realized were actually predatorial. Again, the beautiful Florida horse palm. This is a predator par excellence. Beautiful animals. If you've ever seen these animals uh, in, live in person, they're absolutely exquisite. And of course, some of the cone shells, which we know uh, can eat fish even. One other look, this in the center is more of the families. This is our interactive right here on the right. It is divided into two sections, small wonders, which all of these small shells were photographed at least 40 times and then overlaid to show absolute perfect uh, visibility. So there's, you touch on a, a shell, the name comes up with an enlargement and you actually get to see the beauty. So this is how you move through Fable of Murex resinuloides. There's what it looks like. And over in the case, there it is, number 17. So this is one that kids really enjoy playing with. On the other side, we had same or different. You get to choose whether each pair are the same shell, the same species, or are they different species? A lot of them look similar. A lot of them look almost identical, but you have to decide. So this young man from the Philippines was very interested in particular of the Philippine shells. And so we worked with him and he had a good time. The third try, he finally got one pair right. So now he's finding the pair in the exhibit and deciding whether he thinks they are same or different. Wrong again. <laughs> One more time. Are they the same or are they different? And he was right. <laughs> But you will find things like this will interact with your visitors and engage them in ways that they were not able to do before. That was a photograph of the exhibit we were just talking about, same or different. Then we have color forms and we talk about different color forms within each species and why is that possible? When some shells look the same, every single time, why are some so variable? Variations within a single species. And here we have several different species, each showing variations within their little group. Incredible, isn't it? I'm sorry, can you tell I really like shells? <laughs> And here again, variations within a species. These are all Voluta vespertio or the bat volute. And it shows you some of the forms and many color variations. In the center circle were some of the more exotic of those. Here's one of the teachers talking about where buttons come from or used to come from and some of the uses by man. So that engages children as well as adults who have never had any idea that there used to be real buttons made from mother of pearl or abalone. So we're talking about the pearls that you already saw. As we repeated, almost any mollusk can form a pearl. It's the story of those pearls that are and how they're formed that differs from uh, what most people believe a grain of sand, and I'm sure most of you know this is not true. Albino and normal mollusks, and most people really enjoy seeing these because they've never seen albino seashells. 
our photographer really enjoyed this case too, as you can see. <laughs> there again, our Florida horse comb, albino and natural. <coughs> The growth series of the volutes and how they actually appear close up. Bivalves and the different forms of bivalves. Uh, people just don't understand that most bivalves are edible. In fact, most mollusks are edible, and mollusks, including squids and octopus, uh, cuttlefish, and shells, of course. Are, make up about 80% of the rest of the world's major protein source in their diet. So land snails, freshwater snails. And this is showing a way for people that are handicapped or challenged can slide up under there. You can also, children can see from the front because instead of having no glass and having a solid front, there's glass, which makes it easier for little ones to see. This is looking toward the other end of the exhibit. And this is what you would see if you were walking up from the elevator end of this exhibit. And this is the end, George W. Strake Hall of Malacology. And I hope you've enjoyed this tour. Like I said, come see us anytime. We'd love to give you a personal tour. Thank you so much, Tina. That, um, and I, you know, from having having visited last spring, I um, I think you know, particularly once we got into the video, you could start to get a sense of how uh, impactful the exhibit is as a whole, taken in, and um, particularly those last frames of the video. Um, it's pretty. One thing that's really amazing to me is how the malacology exhibit at the Houston Museum is so centrally located. So for folks who haven't been there before, um, this is, a, this is a, a major natural history museum. And you, you, you enter this, uh, this, this, this beautiful lobby and head right up the stairs. And in, in, in order to get you know, through to, you know, what maybe are traditionally are, are very, very popular destinations in natural history museums, like the, the great African animal, dire, you know, um, displays and those kinds of things. You need to go through the stray call of malacology to get there. And, um, and it's, uh, it's just something there's in the way that it's exhibited so beautifully and it, in, in its location at the museum you know, is, is exposing so many people for the first time, thousands and thousands, hundreds, you know, hundreds of thousands of people to the world of shells and mollusks and really making, you know, really making a big difference. So that's a big preamble to, I guess, to my question of, um, you know, can you speak a little bit to the Houston Museum's commitment to this, uh, you know, to, to shells and mollusks. I mean, it's, I mean, this redesign is, is beautiful in the latest incarnation, but it, it dates back um, several decades, correct? Yes, several decades. Um, one of our former presidents, Dr. Tom Pulley, was extremely helpful. He felt mollusks, uh, especially in this area, needed to be exhibited, that our kids need to be taught. We work with uh, Houston Independent School District as well as many surrounding other school districts and homeschool groups um, because we feel that education of our kids is important. It, it's not just to go to see big dinosaurs or pretty rocks. There is a purpose and education is the reason we're here. We want people to understand the importance of mollusks to the environment that we are trying to protect, not only the oceans, but our land snails, our, our freshwater clams, and um, it, it, the, the, with the respect for nature that we are finally realizing had gone underfoot for so long, um, is finally being coming to the forefront again and people realize that open spaces must be kept. We must do preserves to, to save certain species, 
not only on land, but in the oceans. Um, right here off of Texas, we have uh, coral reefs, which I'm sure most people have no idea coral reefs were this close to Texas, but within 80 miles and even 60 miles at one point, we have the flower gardens, we have Stetson Bank, and several other large uh, coral reefs. They're not quite like Florida, pretty coral, Florida reef. They don't have the large branching corals. Most of these are covering corals. Um, mm. So, and they have migrated here along with many species from uh, Florida and the Caribbean. Uh, we even have those darn lionfish. Um, <laughs> And so fishermen are learning how to catch those and sell them to some restaurants or learning how to uh, use those. And that, that makes us happy. Everything we can take out of there that's not supposed to be there, that's good for the environment. So yeah. that is our basic focus is education. Yeah, and, and I'll say from having been there and I can see from the chat comments that several people have been and um, think it's yeah. an amazing, amazing as, as I do. Um, so how does, how does this display, which is, um, obviously very, very intentionally, uh, treating the specimens almost as, as gems, right? With the, with the beautiful lighting and, um, and the, and the mounts and just the individualized attention and very careful attention to sort of the groupings and what you've done with color and everything. How does that compare to... The previous, you know, but before before you you redid the exhibit. Well, um, the it, it, those of you who may have seen the exhibit before, it was beautifully done. It was um, all up. Uh, it was glass on all sides, and so you could see through each exhibit to see the front and the back, um, which was great. But the shells were damaged so greatly because of the lighting, and it, it had actually stayed in place for a little over 10 years, which is a long time for a certain shell to have that kind of intense light. Um, so they were, it did a lot of damage to between the heat and the light itself did a lot of damage to some of those, and some of those were very important specimens. So the idea here is we don't want to keep replacing what we have because we've used these and now they're no good. These shells are not replaceable. Many of them have gone extinct. Some of them are from places that are no longer uh, allowed to have collecting, which is great. We love the protection. Um, so this primary goal here was to save what we have and show it to its best ability so that people understand the importance of these beautiful things. Not only are they beautiful, but they have a purpose in their environment, in their habitat. And that's what we need people to understand how important this is. Thank you. Uh, I see a question from Claire um, asking if you're concerned about using fabric as the background over, over time. Um, this exhibit, we feel, will probably be replaced within eight years, which if this was since the basic installation was completed in 2019. So within uh, 2027, we feel like it will be replaced. Um, the fabric we did test, uh, this is an acid-free fabric. Nothing that touches these shells is damaging in any way, even to the point of where metal does not actually touch the shells. They're protected with uh, a tiny layer of non-abrasive, non-reactive material. So we feel like the cloth and the fabric was selected. It took us several months to decide what to do, which ones to use, and we did do extensive research into which one was best. Mm -hmm. um, the painted surfaces faded uh, over time. The uh, formica just gave too much reflection and that was not what we were looking for in this exhibit. So mm -hmm. this was something we felt would, would work well for the limited years we needed it to stay clean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, um, you mentioned before the, the, the previous uh, exhibit set up the, the lighting 
um, among other things, doing some damage to the specimens. Was that, um, was it sort of fading colors? I mean, was it having the same effect? Was the light, is that like kind of like works on paper or something like that, what, what yeah. light can do there? Yeah. Yeah, it definitely faded many of the specimens, uh, some of them really, really severely. Most of yeah. them were, were okay, but not where they were in original condition. And that yeah. hurts. Um, I hate seeing beautiful shells of any, whether they're rare or not, I hate seeing shells being uh, intentionally destroyed. So yeah. we have to start saving what we have. We have to yeah. stop taking things out of the wild. Yeah, and there's a- there, you're, Yeah. Yeah. And your your strong conservation message is 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 present throughout throughout the exhibit, and it's well, it's wonderful. We hope so. We hope so. Little things like um, don't put your grease down the, the sink. Put it in something and put it out in the garbage, or take it to a recycle station. There yeah. are oil and uh, grease recycle places. Um, if you use plastic bags, either dispose of them correctly, reuse them, or take them to a recycle area. Mm -hmm. um, most grocery stores have areas where they recycle those plastic bags. We prefer you using fabric bags to do your grocery shopping. And so that's a small thing people can do. Start yeah. carrying your own plastic, your own cloth bags and don't take home all those plastic bags. So it's little things throughout the exhibit that we kind of shared with people to make an in a difference in in their own home without, I mean, the kids get a kick out of that. Mommy, yeah. we're saving this can, let's wash it out. So they're learning yeah. to recycle. Yeah, well, it's great. And a, a museum like Houston with the number of visitors who go through there, you know, getting those kinds of messages um, throughout the museum, but, um, but, but in, your, in your exhibit as well, and also getting that kind of exposure to, to shells and mollusks is, is really wonderful. So, Thank you very, very much, Tina. It was a it was a treat to to take a take a tour for me, another tour through through the Strake Hall of Malacology. Congratulations again on you. your accomplishment and and thank you for it. And um, uh, thank you so much for for the program tonight. And then thank thank our audience for for joining us. And uh, again, I can't. You know, can't recommend highly enough. Uh, uh, you know, a visit to Houston and um, to see it. It's really, it's very special. Welcome so. to have you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye.